Welcome back to... Is that how I start? We haven't done a YouTube video in so long, I don't even know how to start. How do I say it? How do I... Hello everybody, and welcome back. You are listening to The Voice of Reason. And on today's episode, we are going to be responding to responses of a recent video that we put out on TikTok. We will also be responding to a few videos that a lot of my followers on TikTok have been asking me to respond to. So before we begin, I just want to remind you all to please like, share, and subscribe. Let's see. Video number one is from a messenger of truth. Can I be Protestant and still go to heaven? You can be Protestant and still go to heaven, but you have no assurance of going to heaven. The only assurance that you can have is to know that you are Catholic, that you're in communion with the Pope, and that you're in a state of grace. Be in a state of grace in full communion with Jesus Christ. That's Where's the mention of believing in Jesus or repenting or the fact that he shed his blood on the cross to justify the many? The entire book of 1 John is about so where is the mention of believing in Jesus and repenting or the mention of the fact that he shed his blood on the cross for the justification of the many? Sir, if you go back to what I said, I said that you have to be in a state of grace. Everything that he lists here is part of what it means to be in a state of grace. To believe, to repent, to have faith, and to walk with the Lord. If you do all of those things, you're in a state of grace. That's what it means. The entire book of 1 John is about assurance of salvation. That's the book that you go to when you talk about So he says that the entire book of 1 John is about assurance of salvation. And he, in the video here, it shows 1 John chapter 5, verses 13 through 14. Very interesting that he chose 1 John chapter 5, verses 13 through 14. They said that you have assurance of salvation. Because if you keep reading on in 1 John chapter 5, right after verse 14, John gets into what? Talking about the distinction between mortal and venial sin and how mortal sin is deadly, deadly sin, and how deadly sin uh, separates you from the body of Christ. So, he literally right there in the context of what he brought up in 1 John chapter 5 talks about mortal and venial sin. So, According to John, it's possible for Christians who are believers in Jesus Christ, who have repented, it is possible for them to commit mortal sin. And if they do that, they are spiritually dead. So if he wants to say that 1 John chapter 5 teaches assurance of salvation, he probably should have read after verse 14. Talk about assurance. And no, the Pope is not mentioned there. Let me give you a better answer. Everyone who believes in Jesus will never die. And everybody who True. believes in Jesus will walk in the light of life. That is salvation by grace through faith, not of works. And then necessary sanctification True. comes next. That's when the works come, okay? That's called True. imputed righteousness. And that's something that the Catholic Church hates because it destroys self-righteousness. Your good deeds in your life are not... Everything that he was saying was true up until the point where he said that it was called imputed righteousness which is something that the Catholic Church hates because it destroys self-righteousness. The idea of imputed righteousness is something that never existed in Christianity until the Protestant Reformation. It was Martin Luther himself who made up the idea of imputed righteousness. And that idea is that we are sinners, we remain sinners, we'll still always be sinners, but God, when he looks at us, he just sees his son, and he sees his son Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for us. So even though we are sinners, God, he sees the righteousness of his son. And that understanding of the atonement is something that Martin Luther himself came up with. And it's something that John Calvin, after Luther, went deeper on. And he went off the deep end and he came up with things such as double predestination, the idea of eternal security that you can't lose your salvation. So everything that he listed here... It's part of being in a state of grace. But then his understanding of that is uh, faulty. It's not biblical. It's not true. What the Bible teaches is that Jesus actually really does make us righteous. God doesn't just declare us righteous. It's not just something legal. It's something true. It's something real. There is an ontological change in our souls when we are in communion with Jesus Christ. He makes us righteous. He doesn't just look at us and then say that we are righteous just because it's some arbitrary legal position that we're in. It's actually true. He makes us righteous. Good deeds in your life are not your own. They're his who lives in you. And that was it. Well, I was expecting a lot more. Let's see. Oh, this one's going to be good. This is from... 
I don't know if this guy is a Unitarian heretic, but he always edits in this Unitarian pastor. I don't know. What is his name? The pastor dude? The God ain't got no mother, you old Catholic liar. Mary, the mother of God. God ain't got no mother, you old Catholic liar. That's right. That one. Gino, Pastor Gino. Pastor Gino is a Unitarian heretic. And this guy, I don't know. I mean, he always post Pastor Gino, so I would imagine that he's also a Unitarian heretic, but this is what he had to say about me in my response to the very controversial video, a controversial clip that was put out on TikTok about the assurance of salvation as it relates to Protestants. Let's see what he has to say. Sure. Hey y'all, come look at this. Can I be Protestant and still go to heaven? You can be Protestant and still go to heaven, but you have no assurance of going to heaven being a, a Protestant. The only assurance that you can have of making it to heaven is to know that you are Catholic, that you're in communion with the Pope, and you lost your mind. Despite these statements being blasphemous, I just have one question for you. Can you give the people a Bible verse that says, the only assurance to heaven is being a Catholic? I must have missed a chapter in the Bible because I can't even find the word Catholic in the entire 66 plus books. Secondly, I want to read. All right, let's start with the first objection. Whoever you are, whoever you are, you're just some nobody on TikTok, whoever you are. It's very interesting to me that you argue just like a Muslim. You argue just like a Muslim, my friend. You do. You use the logical fallacy called asking a loaded question because the question that you asked is, where does it say in the Bible that you have to be Catholic, where you have to be... Let, let me rewind that. What does it say exactly? <laughs> Hold on. The only assurance to heaven is being a Catholic. I must have missed a chapter in the- He said to show him a verse in the Bible that says that the only assurance is being a Catholic. That is what is known as the fallacy of a loaded question. That's like if I were to ask you, so Mr. Whoever you are on TikTok, when did you stop beating your wife? And the way that Muslims do it with Christians is when they say, show me a verse in the Bible where Jesus himself says, I am God, worship me. Show me a verse in the Bible where Jesus himself says, I am God, worship me. Muslims will always say, if you can show me that verse in the Bible, I will become Christian right now. That is a loaded question. And you, sir, I am sure that if a Muslim were to ask you that question, you would have called the Muslim out, wouldn't you? And you would rightly say, you're asking a loaded question. Uh, it's a loaded question to demand that somebody show you something in the exact words that you want it to be in. So that is a logical fallacy. But to answer your question, it is very simple that Jesus Christ founded a church. The apostles are the leaders, were the first leaders that he appointed uh, within that church. And when you read all throughout the New Testament, you see that they are telling the people that they're writing to that they all need to be in unity with each other, that they all need to be of one mind, that they all need to be united in the one church of Jesus Christ. And we know that the one church of Jesus Christ is the church that Jesus Christ built upon who? The Apostle Peter. In Matthew 16, 18 through 19, Jesus tells Peter, tells Simon, you are the rock, and then changes his name to Peter. By the way, Peter means rock. And he says, and upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of heaven shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. It's very simple. When I say that you need to be in communion with the Pope to be in full communion with Jesus Christ, the reason that I say that is because the papacy is a divine institution that was given to the church by Jesus Christ. If you deny anything, even if it's just one thing, if you deny even one thing that Jesus Christ taught or anything that Jesus Christ established, you are not in full communion with Jesus Christ. You just are not. You can believe 99% of the things that Jesus taught hold to 99% of the things that Jesus wanted us to hold to. But if just that 1% alone that you reject, means that you're not in full communion with him. If you're going to follow Jesus, you need to follow him completely. You need to follow him fully. You need to assent to every single thing that he taught and commanded us to do. And what he commanded us to do is to be in communion with his church, which is the church that is built upon the apostle Peter. The apostles themselves, um, by the way, it's very simple. We have to follow Jesus, right? Jesus said that if we want to follow him, 
we have to follow the apostles. In Luke 10, 16, Jesus told the apostles, whoever believes you believes me, whoever rejects you rejects me. So if we want to follow Jesus Christ, we have to follow the apostles. We can't have Jesus without the apostles because he said so. And also, if it weren't for the apostles, we would not know Jesus. We would not know who he is. The only reason that we know what we know about Jesus Christ is because the apostles were the ones who wrote and taught about Jesus. And without them, Jesus would have been lost to pretty much most of history. So you can't separate Jesus from his church. You can't separate Jesus from the church leadership that he himself established. And that includes the papacy. You see, Protestants, they reject a lot of what Jesus gave us. They reject the church that Jesus gave us. They reject everything that within the church, like the sacraments. They reject all of the ancient and holy practices of the Christian church. The only thing that they've kept is the Bible itself. And even then, they removed a lot of books from the Bible. So that's the only thing that they've kept is the Bible. And uh, everything else that Jesus commanded us to do, they got rid of. Uh, the Orthodox, they have 99.9% .9 of everything that Jesus Christ gave us. The only thing that they're missing is the papacy. Where do you find the papacy? In the Catholic Church. And because the papacy is a divine institution, as we read in Matthew 16, 18 through 19, and you also see, just so you guys know, everything that the Catholic Church teaches about the papacy is in Scripture. Matthew 16, 18, 19, as well as Luke 22, is where Jesus says that he will pray for Peter and Peter alone, that his faith will not fail, that his faith will not fall into error, papal infallibility. And then also in John 21, Jesus makes Peter the universal pastor of the entire church. When he asks Peter, Peter, do you love me more than these? Talking about the other apostles who were right there in the presence of Jesus and Peter. And Peter said, yes, I love you more than the other apostles love you. And he said, feed my sheep, tend to my lambs, feed my sheep. Also in Luke 22, Jesus gave Peter the charge to unify and strengthen the other apostles. So Peter is the mark of unity for Jesus is church, right? So Peter is the chief apostle. He is the head of the other apostles. And that charism that Peter has continues down to the present day and always has continued since the apostolic age through the successors of Peter. Jesus said to follow him, we need to follow his apostles. And the apostles said that to follow them, we need to follow their successors, the men that they laid their hands on and ordained as ministers of God. We need to follow those guys. And those guys laid their hands on other men and ordained them as ministers of God. And those guys laid their hands on other men and ordained them as ministers of God. And that unbroken chain of succession from the apostles continues down to the present day in the bishops of the apostolic churches. And with the apostle Peter specifically, his, uh, one of his lineages, because he was bishop in multiple dioceses, um, but he, uh, Peter died in Rome, so his final successors are from Rome. It was Peter, and then it was Linus, Cletus, Clement, Avaristus, Sixtus, Alexander, and it goes all the way down to the present day with the present Pope. So the Pope is the successor of the Apostle Peter, and the Pope has the same charisms that the Apostle Peter had in his office. The office that St. Peter the Apostle had still exists to this day, because it's a divine office that was instituted by Jesus Christ. And because it's something that was given to us by Jesus Christ, you cannot reject it. If you reject it, you cannot be, you are not in full communion with Jesus Christ. Because if you want to be in full communion with Jesus Christ, you have to accept every single thing that he gave us. You cannot pick and choose. ...in the Bible because I can't even find the word Catholic in the entire 66 plus books. Secondly... Also, he says that he can't find the word Catholic in the entire 66 plus books. And by the way, it's not 66 plus books. It's actually 73 books, like I mentioned earlier. Protestants remove books from the Bible, but that's a separate issue. So this man says that he can't find the word Catholic in the entire corpus of Scripture. Very interesting, because I'm sure that this man would say that the Church of Jesus Christ is good. I'm sure he would say that it's necessary. I'm sure he would say that it's evangelical. I'm sure that he would say that it is uh, righteous. I'm sure that he would say all of these things about the true Church of Jesus Christ, right? I'm sure that he would use all kinds of adjectives to describe the church. But all of those adjectives that I listed, and probably a lot of the ones that he would use to describe the church, are also not in scripture either. 
Scripture doesn't say that the Church of Jesus Christ is good, or that it is evangelical, or that it is necessary, or that it is righteous. It doesn't say any of those things, right? But that wouldn't stop us from saying all of those things, from using those adjectives to describe Jesus' church. Well, I wonder if this man knows that the word Catholic is actually an adjective. The word Catholic just means universal. It is an adjective. If he would use all of those other adjectives to describe the church, why wouldn't he use the word universal to describe the church? It's an adjective. So, again, that doesn't work either. I would say, where does the Bible say that every single adjective that we use to describe the church has to be in the Bible? I want to read about this communion with the Pope and the Bible. When I read the Bible, I already explained that. God tells me that in Ephesians 1 verse 4, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy, not Catholic, not Muslim, not Hindu, but holy. Remember, Catholic, when you stand before God, you will give an account of your teachings to people and associating... Another logical fallacy, that is a false equivocation. Because the Bible says in one verse that we are called to be holy, that means that we can also be Catholic. Logical fallacy, false equivocation. ...people and associating salvation with the rotten Pope. Rotten Pope? I wonder if this guy has a bias towards one position. Jesus never founded the Catholic Church, brothers and sisters. Jesus said they are. Jesus Christ did found the Catholic Church, and that's easy to prove because uh, we have the unbroken chain of successors from the apostles down to the present age. And again, what that shows us is that all of the apostolic churches, Catholic, Orthodox, Oriental Orthodox, Assyrian Church of the East, that those are all the one church that Jesus Christ founded. We have the list, and also, if you actually go into the Bible and you read all of the writings that Paul wrote, you know, you open the New Testament and you see that Paul wrote letters to the Romans, to the Corinthians, to the Galatians, to the Ephesians, to the Philippians, to the Colossians, to the Thessalonians. If you go to all of those churches, those churches still exist today. And guess what you find? When you go and you visit those ancient churches that Paul was writing to in the first century, you're going to find out that all of those churches that Paul wrote to and all of the churches that you read about, all of the local churches that are in the book of Acts, every single one of those churches is either Catholic or Orthodox. So yes, it is a fact of history that Jesus Christ founded the one holy catholic and apostolic church which unfortunately is divided into four separate communions but yes jesus christ founded the catholic church jesus said they error because they don't know the scriptures. the scriptures have you ever found the catholic religion in here yeah. Go ahead. Then why are you so catholicism is dripping off of every single page in the new testament and people who don't know that, it's because they really don't know what Catholicism teaches and they misunderstand the Bible. To the priests! That's right. He said something what? about me Why are you confessing to the priests? Why are we confessing to the priests? Because Jesus Christ in John chapter 20 gave his apostles, who by the way were the first priests, Jesus ordained his apostles as priests uh, right before they sat down for the Last Supper. In John chapter 20, he uh, gives his apostles the authority to forgive sins. He breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. And actually, before he even says that, he says, just as the Father has sent me, so I send you. So Jesus says, I am sending you, talking to the apostles, in the exact same way that the Father sent me. And then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Uh, whosoever sins you forgive are forgiven. Whosoever sins you retain are retained. And also in the writings of Paul, for example, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul actually mentions the ministry. He calls it a ministry. It is the ministry of reconciliation. And he specifically says in 2 Corinthians 5 that it is a priestly ministry. Priests are the ones that uh, Jesus Christ forgives our sins through. If you're okay with Jesus utilizing the apostles to spread the gospel, if you're okay with Jesus using men uh, fallible men, right, except for when they're protected by the Holy Spirit, when they're inspired by the Holy Spirit to teach uh, definitively. If you can accept that God uses men to um, achieve whatever ends he wants to achieve, why do you have a problem? If, if you're okay with God sending preachers, teachers, evangelists, healers, and why do you have a problem with God sending other men to forgive sins? Why? It's an arbitrary standard that Protestants have. 
Let's see. What? That's right. You confess to the priest. The priest should be confessing to you. <laughs> a priest should only be confessing to you if you're a priest. How he been watching you all these years. Have you ever stopped to go to the book of scripture? Yeah. To find out whether that religion exists in here? And that's it. Again, not very impressed. Nothing but logical fallacies, misunderstandings. This one is one that a lot of you guys tagged me in. Let's see what this guy's up to. Let's see what this guy's doing. So, in the video, that it says preaching inside of a Catholic church. And it looks like... Okay, so this guy is being forced to leave the church by two ushers. And he is saying that the rosary is heresy. First of all, I don't think that this guy knows what the word heresy means. And most people use the word heresy incorrectly. Heresy is anything, any belief that contradicts anything that is dogma. The rosary is not a heresy because the rosary cannot be a heresy because the rosary isn't a belief. The rosary is a practice. It's a practice, not a belief. Practices cannot in and of themselves be heretical. Practices are informed by doctrine, but they are not doctrine themselves. So when you call something a heresy, it's because it's an incorrect doctrine. The rosary isn't a doctrine, so it can't be a heresy. You can say that it's a bad practice or that Christians shouldn't have that practice. You could say that, but then you are going to want to explain why a meditation prayer over the gospel, a meditating and praying on the gospel, why that would be bad. Why is that a heresy? Why? That makes no sense whatsoever. Let's see. Mother Mary is nothing. It's about knowing Jesus Christ. He just said Mary is nothing. What do you think that the apostles would have said to you if you told them Mary is nothing? What do you think that the early Christians would have said to you if you told them Mary is nothing? What do you think that Jesus would have said to you if you said to him, that girl, that woman that gave birth to you, that woman that gave you your human nature, that woman that God chose to play an instrumental and unique role in the salvation of mankind, that woman that you call mom, that woman that nursed you, that woman that raised you, that woman that took care of you, that woman that loved you in a way that no other creature ever had the grace of loving you like, that woman is nothing. What do you think Jesus would have said to you? What do you think the apostles would have said to you? What do you think the early Christians would have said to you? You know what they would have said to you? They would have called you a heretic and they would have cast you out of the church. Paul would have written a very strongly worded letter about you. And the earliest Christians, like, I don't know, let's say, say Nicholas probably would have smacked you in the mouth. Like he smacked Darius in the mouth. This is actually very appropriate. A heretic being... Forced out of the church, that's appropriate. Run from Catholicism. The rosary and Jesus tells us to sway away from repetitive prayer. Okay, he just added to the word of God. He said that Jesus tells us in Matthew 6, 9 to stay away from repetitive prayer. The Bible doesn't say that. Jesus Christ didn't say that. Jesus didn't say to stay away from repetitive prayer. Matthew 6, 9, Jesus says, do not pray like the heathen do. That's what he said. Repeating prayers, thinking that they'll be heard because of their many vain words. Jesus does not condemn repetition. If Jesus condemned repetition, you would have to condemn the book of Psalms because all over the book of Psalms, what do you see? You see repetition. You see repetition all over in the book of Psalms because the book of Psalms is meant to be prayed. Also in the book of Revelation, the angels that are praying over and over again, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. And even Jesus himself prayed repetitive prayers as Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane awaiting to be arrested and to go into his passion. The Bible tells us that he repeated the same prayer over and over again. So no, Jesus didn't condemn repetitive prayer. That wouldn't make sense with the other data that we have from scripture. Jesus was condemning praying like how the heathens prayed with their vain repetitions thinking that they'll be heard because of their many words. Were the heathens praying the rosary? I don't think so. This is real heresy. And the real problem going around right now is the churches with this religion and this churchianity and they're not even going to the biblical way but of doing They're not going to the biblical way of doing things. Well, I can make that accusation to him. 
that he is not doing things the way that the Bible tells us to do them. He doesn't understand the Bible. He misunderstands the Bible. And the Bible doesn't say what he thinks that it says. This is why we need a magisterium, because then we get people like this who don't know what they're talking about, and they start misusing the Bible. The video I'm about to show you is me walking into a Catholic church, walking up onto the pew and preaching to the Catholics. I was blown away and I was astounded at the Catholics with what they said after the fact. But first, I'm going to let you watch the video. I feel like I have a quick word. First of all, who let this guy... Who let this guy get up on the abo in front of all the people that were there and speak? I'm pretty sure that the only reason he would have been allowed to speak is probably because he told them that he was going to be talking about something. And then once he got up there, he probably started saying whatever he's about to say in this video. If that's what he did, he lied. Because I can't think of any reason that they would let this guy go up there and speak. Did this guy lie to the people that were there and tell them that he was Catholic? Or tell them that he was going to say something that was going to edify the people there? How did he get up there? That's what I want to know. Uh, and maybe he'll tell us. Maybe he'll see this and he'll tell us. What did you do to allow those people to get up there and speak? Because you clearly aren't Catholic. Did you tell them that you were Catholic? Is that what you did? Did you lie? Are you a liar? Probably. Chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except for me. I want to read this verse uh, to you from the rosary. I have obtained from my divine Son that all advocates of the rosary shall have for intercessors. There is no way to the Father except for Jesus Christ. So he quotes John chapter 14 verse 6 as if Catholics have never, ever, ever, ever come across John chapter 14 verse 6. We can't come to him through Mary or any of the saints. And back in Matthew um, 23, Jesus gives us a direct instruction not to call anyone Father. Matthew 23 9, the famous called no man Father. I have many, vi I have some videos on that. I wonder what he calls his own dad. He says that there are no intercessors. I wonder if he's ever read 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 1 where Paul tells all of us to intercede for everyone. So he says there's no intercessors. That's not what the Bible says. I wonder if he's ever read Revelation 5, 8 and 8, 3 where it talks about how the angels and the saints in heaven bring the prayers of the saints on earth to the throne of God. The reason it's so important to understand Catholics are going to hell is because it is a completely false religion. So he is saying that all Catholics, all Catholics are going to go to hell because it's a false religion. Interesting. Not even I would go that far. In my video that people responded to, which I responded to earlier, in that video, I said that it's possible for Protestants to go to heaven. There's just no assurance of it. This guy is making more extreme claims than me. He's saying that all Catholics are going to hell because they're on the false religion of Catholicism. By the way, calling Catholicism a false religion, that falls under the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Jesus himself says in the Gospels that when you call what is good bad, and when you call what is bad good, that is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. So this guy just said that the church that Jesus Christ founded is a false religion. That is blasphemous. Whether he knows it or not, he's just committed blasphemy. And anyone who says that, you are committing blasphemy. If you say that the Catholic Church is false or that it's of the devil, of Satan, all those things is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Everything they're teaching, they hide it in this, right? We both believe Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. But we miss the strong fact that they're worshiping false gods. That's a misrepresentation. That's a lie. That's not true. If this guy really, honestly, and sincerely believes that Catholics worship false gods, that Catholics worship idols, he has no business, no business whatsoever making any videos or talking publicly about Catholicism because clearly he does not know what Catholicism actually teaches. Without well, one statement that Catholics worship false idols, that one statement alone is enough to disqualify him from anyone taking him seriously. This guy should be ignored because he doesn't even know what Catholicism teaches. He hates Catholicism, but I don't even think he really hates Catholicism. Because honestly, 
nobody really hates Catholicism. They hate what they think Catholicism is. And this guy thinks, uh, whether he's sincere or not, I don't know, but it seems like this guy thinks that Catholicism is an idolatrous, uh, unholy religion of the devil. If that's what he thinks, he's just dead wrong. He doesn't know what Catholicism teaches. So he should shut his mouth and he shouldn't be making videos and publishing them on the internet for the whole world to see because he's making himself look really stupid because we don't teach the things. Catholicism doesn't teach or believe in the things that he's claiming that it teaches and believes. So he's making himself look really, really foolish. As we are walking out of the service, they began to say, Hail Mary, Hail Mary over us which was weird. That is beautiful that those people that saw this guy after that little stunt that he pulled, that they started praying for him. And that's good. I really, really hope that we all pray Hail Marys for this guy right here because Mary loves this guy more than anybody could, right behind Jesus. And Mary wants this guy to be united to Jesus Christ. Mary wants this guy to come into the Catholic Church to be in full communion with her son. So I think that all of us should pray Hail Marys for this guy because clearly he needs him. Which was weird, and this is what I was most shocked about. While we were outside, they were disputing amongst us, and we were talking. They told us that the Bible is not true. I did not know personally that the Catholics do not believe in the Bible and the Word of God. They said it's written by sinners and it's not a true word question yourself if you're in Catholicism. Again, I don't want to call him a liar. I'm pretty sure that didn't happen. I promise you that there are no Catholics that would say that the Bible is wrong, that the Bible is not the word of God, that it's not a true word. No Catholic would say that. I'm pretty sure he made that up. I'm pretty sure that didn't really happen. But again, hey, I'm not going to call him a liar, but I don't think that happened. Because there is no intercessor besides Jesus Christ himself. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says that Jesus is our only mediator, but the Bible does say that we are all called to be intercessors for each other because the body of Christ cannot be separated. Another fallacy that a lot of Protestants make is that they conflate intercessors with mediators. Wrong. I want you to look closely at this image because in the front of this Catholic church, they had a picture of Jesus Christ red with horns on him. And yes, this was a Catholic church. They had a picture of Jesus Christ with horns on him. <sighs> this guy's a liar. I'm just kidding. Uh, no, no Catholic church would have a picture of Jesus Christ with horns on him. Maybe he is a liar. I don't know. Maybe he is. Uh, I don't believe what he's saying. So either he's just very misinformed or he's crazy or he's a liar. One of those. The most likely is that he's a liar because I don't believe what he just said. All right. Ryan Foley. Not impressed. Not impressed. The only guy that I actually think is like worthy for like a debate, I'm going to say it right now on live, True Christian Ministry. Now that is a guy that knows what he's talking about. That is a guy that is a worthy opponent for a debate. That is a guy that's serious. That is a guy that doesn't misrepresent. That is a guy that knows what the other position actually teaches. So for any of you that might think that I just don't want to debate these people, no, I want to debate people who are serious. So True Christian Ministry, that is a guy that will I will always be open to debate him because he seems to be charitable and uh, he seems to be very knowledgeable. So him, I'll debate. That's a tr I need to start responding to him because he is worthy of a response instead of responding to these clowns. But the reason that I respond to these clowns is because my followers, you guys, you guys ask me to respond and I will always do whatever you guys asked me to do especially with this guy there was an overwhelming amount of people that asked me to respond to him all right well thank you very much everybody i know that, that was a bit of a longer video um but i just wanted to respond to all of these right away because so many of you tagged me in all of these videos and all of these guys that i responded to i am always open to have a good faith conversation with them um i am going to push back i am going to be stern because you guys misrepresent us a lot you guys don't understand catholicism you guys don't understand uh what it really teaches and you guys make a lot of false claims i'm not going to take that lightly i'm going to defend jesus christ i'm going to defend Jesus' church i'll always have a good faith conversation with whoever wants to have a good faith conversation but a lot of these uh people I don't know. It just, it doesn't seem like they're into really knowing what the truth is because it's really, really simple. Like a quick Google search, honestly, would be able to debunk a lot of the false things that they say. So that tells me that they're not looking into the claims that they're making before they make them. They just make all these claims and they have all of these uh, false notions in their head of what Catholicism is and what it teaches. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. Thank you for all of the support. Remember to like, share, and subscribe. And remember, Jesus is Lord, and the Catholic Church is the church that he founded. God bless you guys. See you next time.